Welcome to a special edition of the State of Ohio. I'm Karen Kassler. Those 13 people who are dying of heroin, fentanyl, prescription painkiller, and other opioid-related overdoses every day in Ohio, they all have parents, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and kids. The Public Children's Services Association of Ohio says half of the children taken into custody had parents who were using drugs. And the Ohio Department of Health estimates 84 babies are being treated each day for drug withdrawal. Joe Engels reports on how families, caregivers, and advocates are connecting to care and helping with the trauma, confusion, and devastation left on kids by opioids. For some children of drug-addicted parents in Ohio, the struggle starts the moment they are born. The numbers in 2015, we had 2,100 babies in Ohio that had to go through withdrawal and um, the number's increasing. That's why Jill Kingston says the facility in Kettering that she operates is needed. It provides the medical treatment that is given in a hospital in a comfortable home-like setting. So when a baby goes to withdrawal, you might see them shake a lot and it's called tremor. Um, they have a high-pitched sound that they, they scream, they cry a lot, um, they have a difficult time feeding. She says the number one comfort for a baby suffering from opioid withdrawal is being held in someone's arms. These drug-addicted babies at Bridget's Path are cared for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until they've finished their medicated withdrawal. And while that's happening, people at the center are working with the mother to make sure she's getting treatment. And they work with Children's Services to hopefully find a family member who is willing to take care of the baby until the mother is clean and able to take care of the infant on her own. Kingston says sometimes the babies cannot be placed with family members, so they have to be put into the already burgeoning foster system. That's a problem Christy Burry knows all too well. She says eight out of ten kids now in protective custody in Fairfield County are there because of parental substance abuse. And she explains 65 percent of them are placed outside Fairfield County and spread throughout 30 counties across the state. When we can't keep a child close to home, um, that means they're leaving their community. They're oftentimes leaving their school, they're leaving their friends, they're leaving their church, they're leaving their social activities. And so when we think about the impact that that has on a child's mental health, um, and when we look at that through a trauma lens, no wonder they're having all kinds of issues. Burry says many of the kids coming into the system now have experienced trauma significant enough that they require mental health treatment. She says a few years ago, about 3% of the children taken into protective custody required care from a residential treatment center. 25% of the children that we have to take into um, protective custody are in a residential treatment center setting, not in a uh, family foster care setting. Um, and um, to add on to that, that 25% of those kids accounts for almost 65% of the costs associated with taking care of those kids. Um, it is expensive. Many of those facilities are $300, $400, $500 dollars a day just for when one child. So when we and those treatment centers are of often kids, in other states. Burry says the agency has been forced to send some children needing treatment as far away as Missouri. That's a problem when parents receiving addiction treatment want to reunite with their children. Valerie's two sons, 9 and 12, have been living with their grandma while their mother tries to beat her opioid addiction through a program at Amethyst in Columbus. It's a far cry from just a dozen years ago when Valerie was a straight-A student in nursing school. But after her mother passed away, Valerie says she couldn't cope, so she turned to drugs. When she couldn't afford the drugs, she turned to soliciting, which landed her in jail. My addiction took me to a place where I wasn't even able to call and check on my kids. Um, I miss birthdays, I miss holidays, and that's something I'll never be able to get back to them. <sighs> but I pray to God that they learn from me. Um, with their dad being in addiction as well, um, when he overdosed, they were there to find him. They found their dad. Valerie is working to get her children back with her. But they have so much going for them right now, and I'm actually working 
towards visits. I talk to them almost every day. We FaceTime. And they're in a good position. They're in a better place right now than I could have given them at the time. Once Valerie is stable and regains custody, the kids can live with her at Amethyst, where they will also receive counseling and programming. We want to make sure from a program standpoint we're able to support her and her parenting skills and also address the needs of children because we do have several women here um, who have their kids living with them which is kind of a uniqueness about our program that they're able to still have that attachment and bond while their mom's going through treatment which is really neat to see. Amethyst is the only gender specific treatment center of its kind in the state and one of three in the nation that allows children and it's always full, serving an average of 400 women a year. Yeah, so for a, a complete year, it's just under $10,000 for each client per year, but that includes everything. That's the intensive treatment, that's the uh, summer camp program, that's our after school program, it's the food, it's the clothing, it's all of those support services. A good point of comparison is it costs over $22,000 to incarcerate somebody each year. So if you think about that, we're half the cost of incarceration. Our research shows that we're more effective and we prevent a woman from going to prison, being separated from her family more permanently, and then coming out of prison with those collateral sanctions of, of being an inmate in Ohio. Linda Jane says more needs to be spent on treatment, but she says communities also need to be more welcoming to treatment centers such as this one. And I think we have to work as a system to break down those stigmas and to explain to people that if we don't provide treatment and housing, these people are going to be back out in the community, they're going to be back using, potentially committing crimes, and worst case scenario, dying. We're going to continue to lose our brightest young people that have fallen to the disease of addiction. Jane says communities need to realize everyone is affected by opioid abuse, even if they're not personally affected by it. Joe Ingalls, Statehouse News Bureau.